I'm thrilled to welcome Sheetal Sheth to, as our co Copyright Academy guest today. Sheetal is talented and accomplished actress, producer, author, and activist with a long and impressive resume. Sheetal has started in, starred in more than 20 films, won numerous Best Actress awards, and acted in TV shows such as Blue Bloods, NCIS, Nip Tuck, and many, many others. She also starred in and produced the upcoming film Hummingbird and had op-eds published on CNN, Thrive Global, and The Daily Beast. As if that wasn't impressive enough, she has also served in President, Britain, President Clinton's AmeriCorps and is currently on the advisory board of Equality Now. She is also an accomplished author. Her first children's book, Always Anjali, was published in May of 2018. She won, uh, it won the 2019 Purple Dragonfly Storybook Grand Prize and is in its third printing. Matter of fact, it's set to be a series with the next installment titled Bravo Anjali, due to be published very soon. And the list of accomplished goes on and on. Sheetal, I am so thrilled you can speak with us here today. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, thank you for that intro and thank you for such a warm welcome. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, as I said, we're just absolutely thrilled you could participate here. So let me, let me kick things off by referencing uh, an interview you did recently with Her Agenda. Um, in that you were described as being, quote, on a mission to turn lemons into lemonade. Uh, so what does this reference mean to you and what made it motivates you to undertake so many different initiatives and projects from writing children's books to being an actress and producer to supporting marginalized communities? And to be honest, how in the heck do you manage it all? <laughs> Incredible. Time management. Um... I, uh, you know, the lemons into lemonade, you know, I think I, I was joking about that a little because, you know, look, as you know, all of us, your days ebb and flow. And there's a lot that we're dealing with on a regular basis. We're all ha having many hats. We're holding many things. We're juggling, you know, to me, it feels like a very fine high wire at times. Um, and so if I was to get bogged down on all the like, and, and some days are easier than others on all the stuff that isn't great. And there's quite a bit of it. Um, I wouldn't be able to function, frankly, because, you know, personally, I've been through a lot. My friend, I have a lot of people in my, in my circle that are going through a lot. I think us as a, as a country and as a world is going through a lot. And I think we're, we're having to kind of really look at ourselves and figure out, you know, what, what, who, who, not who are we, but like, what, who do we want to be? Because what we've been doing hasn't been working for a lot of reasons. And so it's really about just, you know, making each moment, um, making the most of what you have at the time that you have. And that doesn't mean you don't fight for more, want more, um, demand more, but it's about kind of all the steps and also just getting through the day in a way that feels doable. Um, and that doesn't mean you don't take some days to just <laughs> unwind and stare at the ceiling if that's, if that's what you need to do. But in general, you know, and I have small kids, it's really about trying to teach them how to get through the day when things don't go your way. Yeah, that's, ter that's terrific advice, I think, for everyone, no matter what they're their situation and uh, you've really taken that to heart and everything that you've done, really incredible. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, so our organization, the Copyright Alliance, works to educate the public about the value of copyright and advocate on behalf of creators' rights to make a living from their creations. How essential do you think the arts are to society and what are your thoughts on the importance of copyright to enabling creators the ability to earn a living from their craft, whether that craft is acting or authorship or any number of things? I mean, I hugely, <laughs> and I mean, I could go on and on and on and, you know, about this in the sense of, you know, people don't view art, people don't want to pay for art, you know, and I'm sure you hear this all the time, you know, people would never go up to go to a doctor's office and not pay the bill, you know, much like, and, and, and I'm sure you've heard this from so many artists, you know, the amount of emails I get asking me to give what I do that makes me a living, you know, give that service for free, 
which they would never ask of you know a certain type of profession. And and my husband works in the professional world, and they're, they're the way that he's talked to versus the way I'm talked to. We always talk about it because there is this sense that you know as a creative, I should just be sharing you know everything that I can give um, out of the goodness of my heart, out of the betterment of society, etc. Not that I don't believe that arts are essential for you know a, a wonderful society to thrive but there's cost for all of these services as you would anything else and I would argue that you know in a world where copyright is so hard to protect because things are moving so so much and so fast and we have an internet now where you don't even know where the source of some of this stuff is is coming from people just take one thing and then put it here and you know all of a sudden it's gone viral and you don't know who to credit or you don't know where it came from when you should or some people care and some people don't, you know, in films, plagiarism is a huge problem, you know, in terms of piracy, in terms of illegal downloads. You know, I think once a movie comes out, it's probably on YouTube like the next day. Um, and that really hurts, especially independent filmmakers and someone who makes independent films, who is bootstrapping everything we do, every, every dollar matters. And also you want to make more. So we need to show that people want to go to our movies and we need to show that there's a, that it's a commodity and then people will pay for that. And so it's a, it's a never ending vicious cycle if we don't clarify. And I think, I don't think we talk about this enough in the sense of like all the jobs that are artists, you know, my kids are at the age where they're like, so what are all the jobs I can do? And I make a point to really um, talk about any of the kind of artist jobs in the same way I talk about a doctor and a lawyer or whatever feels more traditional to people in the sense of the way we value and, and treat it because I just don't think it does anyone a service to perpetuate this narrative that artists are like ah if we feel like it you know maybe we'll, we'll give you we'll give you a free dinner or something you know <laughs> which seems yeah. to be the going the going uh situation it's a uh, it's constant and and I know you know this but um it makes me, I mean, I want to like scream half the time, I'm like, you know, <laughs> but, but it's about setting boundaries, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, it, it, exactly. It just, what you said reminded me I, back when I was in my early days of being a copyright attorney, and I went to this hearing and I heard uh, somebody talking about that, about the, you know, some people just expect to get these, you know, my, my hard work for free, you know, just, hey, just give, give me a copy or whatever. And he gave this example of, not, not that you can compare like, works of authorship or, or, or music or movies or whatever you're talking about to a garnish, but like the parsley growers, no one, you know, the parsley just sitting there on the, on the, on the dish, but you know, people will say, may, might argue, well, it doesn't do very much. Nobody's eating it, but nobody goes to the parsley growers and says, no, no, no just give this to me for free. Right. Right. It's a right. somewhat, somewhat similar type of situation, of course. So um, so I was talking to Neil, Neil Turkowitz the other day. He's a, he's a good friend of, of, of mine and someone who introduced both of us. And he has this saying he often says, which is where there is no financial incentive for the creation and distribution of cultural materials, we end up silencing or limiting storytelling, much to the detriment of society and to creators who are, aren't able to add the diversity of their voices to the cultural mix. So it's essential we all help to ensure that creators are able to choose the manner in which their creations are used. So as a creator yourself, maybe you could comment on his statement a little bit. Well, when I hear that, I, 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 all, I just think about for a very long time, there have been a small group of people that have decided where we put our money and who gets to tell the stories and how. And I think that this idea that Neil is talking about um, in terms of the financial incentive, and, and it's something I talk about as well as a tangent, I'll, I'll briefly mention it, is, you know, as we see these conversations in the last year about kind of authentic representation, about our, our voices being, you know, us telling our own stories, it's not enough to say, okay, I'm gonna give you a platform, I'm gonna let you publish your book, or I'm gonna like buy your movie or whatever it is. You have to put the money behind it. You have to put the resources behind it. You need to treat it the same way you would all the other stuff. Because unless you give it a real shot, you've doomed it, you know, unless you're like that one in the million, which happens sometimes, but people don't realize that all the movies that have done really well for the most part have had a huge machine behind it or the books or whatever they may be. And I work very much in the independent space with, with my books, with my movies, with anything. And I know firsthand 
the limits of what as much as we can do, um, especially when you are up against these big giants, you know. And so for me, it's really about leveling the playing field and making sure that we don't just have a seat at the table, but we are in charge of the table. Um, it's the only way we're going to make substantive change in the right direction. Excellent. So uh, you mentioned uh, your books, your children's books, always mm -hmm. Anjali, uh, which mm -hmm. was I said before, was released in 2018, and and the new, the one that I think the next one, which is coming out, I think this month, we're filming this in. It uh, came out last week. Ah, it came out the perfect. Careful. Yeah, we're, and we're filming this in in September, um, and uh, Bravo Anjali. Um, and those are among the first kids books series to feature a South Asian hero, which is wonderful. So what motivated you to write the children books to begin with? And what was your inspiration for the Anjali storyline? Well, I mean, much like my other job, which is in entertainment, um, you know, it was, I, I started in the nineties as an actress, which was a very different landscape. And I have many, many stories but for another time um, in terms of where we are now. But, you know, when I was expecting my first child, which is now over eight years ago, and um, I was looking at the children's books out there, I was really not shocked, uh, but surprised at how, how little we have moved, you know, in the narratives. And from when I was a child to when my kids are a child, you would think that it would be a different conversation, but, it, but the stuff that was out there, I did not think reflected the world in which we lived it. Um, there certainly was very few South Asian American protagonists in the stories. If there were, it was always centered around a holiday or a religion or something kind of cultural. Um, and I was like, do they not think that we also play instruments and have dogs and go to school and have dinner with our parents and have all the things that everybody else does? It was always very otherizing and very much told through a white lens, you could tell, because it was so either culturally insensitive, inaccurate, or inappropriate, really, frankly. And so I was like, this can't be all we have. You know, we need to have as many stories about the mundane as we do the extraordinary. And not that there isn't a place for those books, but when that's the only narrative you have about brown kids in America, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. And so um, I love, I mean, I tell stories. That's what I feel like I do at the heart of everything I do. I like telling stories. I've worked with kids my whole life. So it's not out of left field that I would be writing children's books. I, since I was literally like five years old, I've been working with kids in some way, shape or form. Um, and so I just started, I thought maybe I'll take a crack at it. And I just, honestly, I'm writing to myself, to my kids, to all of the people I know who have lived these experiences. Um, and I'm writing books for everyone. I want everyone to feel included. I want everyone to feel seen. Um, and the stuff that's pouring out of me has been because I know, I know what it feels like to be a brown kid in this country. And sadly, we still have a long way to go. And so for me, it's about, um, again, telling stories about us that doesn't feel like we're the other and really putting us as the hero of our own story and defining what that means. That's really terrific. Um, <clears throat> it makes a lot of sense. Um, so you talked about your other job. So let's talk about <laughs> that, that for a little bit for a second, um, because I don't, I don't want to ignore that uh, because you've acted in such a vast body of films. Uh, I can't think straight, I'll meet you there, um, looking for comedy in the Muslim world, which you worked with uh, Albert Brooks in, I believe. Uh, the World Unseen, which I know you've earned countless nominations and awards for, and, and I could go on and on. There are just so many other movies and TV series. So because there are so many, you probably get a lot of scripts. How do you decide whether to act in one project or another, especially as a well-known representative as, of the South Asian uh, film and TV community? Like, how do, you how do you even begin to choose? Um, it's really about the material. Um, it's also me not wanting to repeat myself. And I think when I look back at actually my filmography and I think of my career, I think the thing that I'm most proud of is that there is nothing that's the same. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's deliberate. It's also not easy because the minute you do one thing and if you do a good job, people want to just give you like, they're like, oh, you should do this, this, this. And it's like the same thing. Oh, that's why you see certain actors take similar roles and that's fine. And I think all the more power but for me it's not why I'm an actor it's not why I became an actor and so sometimes that means waiting for the right project and sometimes that means you're not going to work for a minute you know um 
or making your own, which is what I started doing recently is kind of creating my own projects that I felt like told stories that I wasn't, that weren't coming to me, but I knew I could do. Um, and just kind of becoming more of the driver in, in all of this. Okay, so now I'm gonna put you on the spot. Uh, is there one film or, or, or TV series or maybe a couple that you've acted in uh, that stand out in, as uh, favorites of yours? And maybe- I mean, it's impossible to pick, but I will just mention um, the film that I'm in post-production on right now called Hummingbird, which is the first feature film that I've produced. I've produced other shorter projects, but this is a feature film that I produced in, I acted in, I helped develop. It was the hardest creative thing I did and then continuing to doing because we're still working on it. Um, it is a monster in the sense of like what it takes to do that and what we did and where we are right now. Um, so I'm, I'm, it's, it's all coming together to hopefully be out next year, but I'm, I'm super proud of just the people that we brought together, um, what we're trying to do with it. It's really innovative and original. There's nothing out there like it, but it's hard because again, we're bootstrapped and it's just like a, a few of us doing it. Um, but I really hope that it opens the door for a lot more, you know? And so that, this is kind of my baby. So mm -hmm. I think it's, it just means more to me in, in, in that sense. Yeah, well, I wish you the best of luck and that, that all you. together and is a huge success. Um, so you, you, kind of looking back at your whole career, you began your acting career as, as a time when very few South Asians were making their living as actors. Um, and I read that you were told that you would have to change your name to secure work, perhaps. Um, instead, you've had and continue to have an incredibly successful career. Um, and at the same time, trailblazing paths for women of color. Uh, how, how have you accomplished those feats and at the same time remain true to yourself? Well, it's not without wondering every day, like, did I make the right decision? <laughs> um, I'm constantly like, I don't even know what, you know, whatever it may be. There's, there's been a number of situations where, you know, at the end of the day, I have to just trust my heart and my gut and figure out what feels right to me. Um, it's true. There have been a number of people early and continuing in my first probably like 10, 15 years of my career that told me I needed to change my name. And not only that, but I was told to my face in a casting office, at least two instances, when I was up for something, it was like my third or fourth audition. So that means you're like in the mix. And the cast director told me like, the producer loves you and they'll hire you, but you need to change your name. Wow. And so, and I didn't, and I didn't. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't get the jobs. And certainly I look back and wonder, was that the fight I should have had at the moment? You know, maybe should I have just dealt with it and you know, have a bigger platform? Who knows? I mean, there's certainly arguments to be made on all sides, but I can only do what feels right to me in the moment at the time and, and be able to live with myself. And so I didn't, you know, and I lost out on a lot of opportunities that would probably would have, you know, I don't know, afforded other opportunities. But I do feel like, I've never not been my authentic self. And I think it's just a lesson that we all have to have for ourselves and figure out where we lie in that. That doesn't mean that can't change or there aren't you know levels and nuance to that. But for me, my name was, was a deal breaker. Yeah, I mean, that must've been a really, really tough decision. <laughs> and as I can tell, as you're talking about it, one that you kind of somewhat rethink uh, over and over. It's again. hard not to, it's hard not to, especially when you see it being such a common thing people do do. I mean, in my, in, in entertainment, every, like so many people are changing their names. And for me, you know, some people change it like just because it's fun and they want to have a stage name. Mm -hmm. And then some change it because they want to take the ethnicity out of it. And for me, that's what I was being asked to do. And I was not going to do that. Yeah, interesting. So I think you've opened some people's eyes with that story in, in, a, in, a, in a good way. Um, so we have, you know, the, the, the people who watch these Copyright Academy videos, for the most part, are other creators who are trying to learn about copyright, learn from other, uh, other uh, creators. And so maybe you can share some about your creative process with them. So when you're writing or when you're acting, um, is there a creative process or methodology that you follow to help you achieve a successful outcome, whether it's in acting? role or maybe producing or writing or anything else that you do that might be creative, is there some type of creative process or methodology that, that you use that might, might inspire some creators mm -hmm. that are watching or help them? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I I always like to define what it is so it's very clear to me and the people that I'm working with. You know, like if I'm the producer, it's a different situation than if I'm someone that's being hired, you know? And so because I, I do both, of, like the different parts of that, whereas like obviously my books, I'm writing them, they're, they're self-generating, they're all coming from my ideas, but at some point we need to sell them and work with a publisher and an illustrator and all of those things. And that becomes a collaboration, but it's very clear. And we make it clear that like the work that I've done is mine. And it's, you know, he said copyrighted and all of those things. Now in the entertainment industry, if you're a hired gun as an actor, you have very little, that's it. Like you're hired and peace out, (laughs) you know? Um, And so, but you have to know that you can't, you know, you have to just really put it in its bucket. I, and I've done that and I continue to do that at times because I can't every, everything, there's a lot of things I want to do and and producing something is a lot more work. Mm -hmm. Um, But then when I produce something, I make a point to, to surround myself with people that I want to surround me. I get a choice Mm -hmm. of who I get to work with and who I want to bring along for the ride. And that I think is powerful because you get to really um, create what you may not have experienced in the past and create an atmosphere that is one of collaboration and um, respect and true you know, artistry where you want people to, to be their best and, and, and hope that there's an environment where everyone feels like they can be. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so uh, you've been really, really generous with your time. So I'm gonna ask you one more question and then and let, let, let you run here. Um, so, uh, and certainly you will also know, we've talked about your work in movies, we've talked to MTV and we've talked about your work as an author, but you're also um, uh, been a really strong advocate and activist and um, you've long been known as a supporter for many worthwhile co- causes and organizations um, and, uh, and marginalized, you know, support for mar- marginalized communities across the world. So what inspires you to be a dedicated advocate and how do you select the causes that you lend your support to? Because there's got to be a lot of different causes out there that are kind of pulling on your heartstrings. Um, Do you have some kind of North Star that guides you as your role as an activist? I mean, how how do you choose? I mean, you just just have to be busy all the time. How do you choose, you know, what uh, what to pursue? It has to be it has to be personal for me, you know, Um, and I think you're right. I think it's there is so many worthy causes. And by the way, there's a lot that pull in my heartstrings that I wish I could do more for. But like you said, there's, there is, you have to pick and choose. And I want to, I'd rather have quality over quantity. And so the personal connection is really important to me. And I would say, because I do so much, I think the buckets that for me resonate the most are obviously education, uh, women and girls' rights, um, equality, you know, and that's because you know, as much chatter as there is about this out there, especially when it comes to women and girls, you know, I just saw the latest, you know, um, report out of the hundreds of billions of dollars that were donated in the last year, the very last bucket was for women and girls. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's very striking because people, we talk about it a lot and people, people are kind of like, I'm over it. It's all we talk about. And I'm like, but at the end of the day, the money isn't going there. And so that speaks for itself. You know, it was like 0.01 something of all of it. And it's heartbreaking really. And so, you know, until we, we can get to a place where we don't, where the policies reflect what we all believe and I don't think we should be debating, it's something that I won't stop fighting for. I need it. I have two, I have two kids. I want the world to be better. I, I desperately don't want them to be fighting about the same things I am right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully that will be the case. So. Um, Chital, thank you so much. It was really, really a thrill to sit down here and talk with you, even though it's remote. Um, <laughs> but really, really appreciate it. I just, I think of everything that you've done and continue to do, and I just get tired thinking about it. <laughs> I'm tired. Been, I'm tired. You've been doing it. It's just so impressive. Just, um, uh, you know, every, everything that you've done from the books to the a- acting and, and activism just uh, so, so impressed. And so thank you so much for being here. I, I, I know all the creators who are watching today will really appreciate it and enjoy watching this as well. So thank you so well, much. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you for taking the time. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Bye.